Okay, so to start, um, Mu Changchun, who's an official at the People's Bank of China, who leads their Digital Currency Institute in a public-facing report recently, described ECNY as a quote, digital version of China's fiat currency. Um, and I think that's that's an accurate description. I think the goal of the People's Bank of China is to design ECNY to serve as a digital form of cash. So M0 for um, the, the formal terminology. Um, I think it is designed to complement or supplement cash. It is not designed as a replacement for paper cash, um, but as, again, a sort of supplement or, or addition to it. Unfortunately, there's very little public facing information about the detail, like the technical details of how ECNY works in practice. Um, the PBOC officials have in the past described it as having, quote, no fixed architecture. The reason for this is because they want to maintain interoperability with different kinds of systems that different commercial banks, different online payment platforms, et cetera, might have. Of course, it's impossible from the outside to verify or evaluate this without more information about um, the exact sort of technical specifications. We do, there are a couple of things that we do know that the ECNY is not uh, from the outside. So for example, we know that it, that it is not a cryptocurrency. Uh, it is not based on a blockchain um, like some cryptocurrencies are. Another key reason why it's not a cryptocurrency is it is a national fiat currency. It is backed by the People's Bank of China and you know, all sort of legal authority um, vested in the People's Republic of China. Similarly, it is not like private payment systems. Uh, from a user's perspective, it probably feels like private payment systems since it operates similarly um, in terms of, you know, you have an app on your phone or something like that. But it is a fiat currency again. It is it is backed by the state. Existing online payment platforms have to operate through commercial banks and have, you know are are at the end of the day private entities. Um, lastly, we also have seen in multiple statements that it is not for international use at least currently. I suppose that could change relatively simply. Uh, I believe the. Some officials at the PBOC have been in talks internationally to discuss sort of the architecture of cross-border sort of transactions involving ECNY and other sovereign digital currencies from other countries. But from when discussion around the PBOC or around ECNY initially started in 2014 to the present day, uh, its use has been entirely uh, domestic, and there has not been any sort of public-facing signal or um, announcement that that will change anytime soon. Okay, so when it comes to how folks use ECNY, uh, it has a what the PBOC describes as a, as a wallet matrix. It has different kinds. So you have a, a soft wallet, um, which is essentially like an app on your phone or an app on a computer. Uh, that works very similar to how online payment platforms have their own apps for payment purposes. Um, you also have hard wallets. These, these are described in documents, to be perfectly frank. I have not personally used a hard wallet, but the idea is that ECNY should be available as a currency uh, for individuals who don't have cell phones necessarily or who don't have access to the growing digital infrastructure that underpins the online payment network um, run by the private companies in China. Um, there are four levels to the wallet. I'll get into those in a little bit more detail later on. Um, in 2019, one of the officials from the PBOC, then the vice governor of the bank, um, said that the, quote, major work of all the sort of technical infrastructure and other aspects of of ECNY had been completed. Again, we, we don't have much details in terms of what that exactly means, but that's what they said. Um, and then lastly, deployment to, to this day has been relatively modest. Uh, I'll get into the details uh, in just a little bit. So the ECNY has a, two, a quote, two-tiered infrastructure, um, meaning that the PBOC does not give 
tokens or ECNY, like the actual currency, directly to users. Rather, it starts at the PBOC and is then distributed to authorized entities, which are generally commercial banks and some online payment platforms that then will, using their own infrastructures, um, transact with merchants and consumers, and then merchants and consumers can, can transact with each other. Um, some other aspects that I think are worth noting is the, uh, the organization known as Nets Union, which by law, the online payment platforms can't uh, clear transactions themselves. They have to do so with commercial banks. And Nets Union is a part public, part private entity within China that sort of manages how the online private payment platforms sort of clear transactions. I think a lot of the current structure raises a very valid question of what has really changed um, compared to say, just using online payment platforms, especially from a user's perspective. Uh, one key concern and or feature, depending on your point of view of ECNY is the extent to which it allows for the government um, to have more information about real-time transactions, um, which is seen by some as a, as a massive surveillance tool, uh, a big concern in China's authoritarian system. The PBOC itself describes the use of ECNY as, quote, managed anonymity um, and articulates it as being more secure or more privacy protecting than, say, using one of the online payment platforms, which requires giving up more personal information and or opening a bank account at a commercial bank, which requires providing more, more personal information. So I described before that there, the wallet has four levels, the most basic level four. Um, is completely anonymous. You only need a cell phone, essentially. So I guess it's not completely anonymous, excuse me. Um, it allows for single transactions of up to 2,000 RMB. Um, once you get to level three, two, and one, one requires sort of the most personal information and allows for the most sort of the highest amount of transactions in any given time and, and over, the, over the span of multiple transactions. Um, I, I will say that I think concerns around digital currencies and surveillance are still valid. In the case of China, um, I, again, the, the PBOC itself has said that surveillance is not a key goal and that they're, they're actually trying to build ECNY to be more privacy protecting, at least in some instances, than existing currencies. And I, I think that's true. That's true in part because to the extent that the Chinese government wants to sort of surveil people, it will not be usually the People's Bank of China that's doing it. It will be other government agencies, including uh, law enforcement, such as the Ministry of Public Security. Um, there's a number of unclear legal requirements around ECNY. Um, so the PBOC itself and, and public facing report says that it's one of the reasons it's, it's trying to, to protect privacy so much is to comply with China's personal information protection law. However, the national security law of the People's Republic of China requires that basically any company dealing with, with digital information and, and transactions sort of store that information. Um, so there remains open questions about how different agencies, whether it's the PBOC itself or law enforcement, can legally access information about ECNY. Um, as well as say engage in more extreme behavior such as freezing accounts or withholding accounts. Um, and there's currently unclear sort of processes for uh, the PBOC and other entities to administer punishments for violation of its stated rules around the use of, AC, of, of ECNY. Um, when it comes to motivations, key articulated motivation is combating crime, particularly money laundering and uh, terrorism financing. Another is online fraud. Um, and so the People's Bank of China is really concerned about all of these. Um, it has stated before that one of the goals of ECNY is to, quote, improve the ability to identify, present, prevent, and resolve cross-industry and cross-market financial risks. This is presumably because of a macro level perspective that they have with the use of ECNY. But again, without a lot of the technical details, it's unsure what exactly ECNY offers. Um, there are concerns around currency sovereignty. This is less, I think, a concern today, but back in the 
20 teens, there, there was more concern in China about sort of the rise of cryptocurrency, of private currencies like DM, um, and just generally, I think, the concern that digital currencies are, are sort of a new, potentially important technology, and the PBOC wanted to make sure it had the personnel and expertise to stay ahead of things. I do not think that um, internationalization is a key goal. Um, responding to the existing duopoly of Alipay and WeChat Pay, which currently have over 90% of market share, I do think is a very important aspect of, of ECNY and the PBOC's deployment of it. There's been longstanding sort of attempts by the PBOC to uh, manage the power of these duopolies, get access to the data they have, um, control how they in, engage in their, in their business practices, et cetera. Um, over right now, the impact on the on the private duopoly has not been super significant, but I think could be more significant over time. Um, and lastly, I'll just say again that I think currently, in, the, in its current form, ECNY is not all that different from um, sort of online just using digital money via online payment platforms, at least from a user perspective. I think the PBOC's goal is to change that to allow for more ways to use the technology and to um, it's expand its use over time, but currently it's not widely used. I think largely in part because there aren't many incentives for users to, to adopt it. It, it. It's very similar. There's still a lot of concerns around privacy, et cetera. And, and for now, folks are sticking with, with what they have. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carmen. Um, let's move on to uh, Martijn. Uh, who um, is going to give us the, the broader view and the European view on uh, digital currency. So please, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Flores, and thank you for the invitation. And good afternoon, all. I will share my screen as well. There we go. Uh, so I will indeed take a bit of broader view. So uh, last year, I defended my PhD thesis about digitalization of money. So I will, of course, use quite some information out of my thesis. Uh, so I think when we uh, take a broader look at this topic, then we should distinguish different phases in digitalization of money. So in the first phase, banks, so private banks, uh, digitalize their banking processes, but also their forms of money. So nowadays, we all have a, a digital bank account. So this is private uh, bank money. So this is the first phase. So in the second phase, so after 2008, a lot of private cryptocurrencies were introduced, uh, most notably Bitcoin, of course, uh, but all forms of private money. So since a couple of years, so a lot of governments and central banks are exploring to update public money to the digital age. So this is the phase we are currently in. So we are thinking, so how can we update public money to the digital age? And quite often when I discuss this topic with central bankers, I, I comment or give them the, the critique that they are really late at the table. So all private forms of money are today digital, but public money is only available in physical form. And as a consequence, uh, public money is also, uh, yeah, you cannot pay anymore with public money in a lot of spaces, especially in countries like the Netherlands and China. So like in the Netherlands, you cannot pay anymore with public money, so physical cash at universities and public transports, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so therefore, this topic of uh, what I call digital public money is, a, is an important topic. So to think about, can we update public money to the digital age? And then a second, also quite maybe a theoretical thing. So when you think about a mon monetary system, then there's always a hierarchy. So in the current system at the top is the central banks. So banks have accounts at the central bank and we uh, non-bank uh, economic agents. So citizens and uh, non-bank businesses have accounts at banks. And all this discussion about what is called by central bankers, central bank digital currencies to give also non-banks access to the central bank. So this is from a kind of theoretical perspective, it is in potential really a big change in the structure of the system. So instead that we all have accounts at private banks, we could also have an account at the central bank. So this is currently being explored. And also a very brief history of central bank digital currencies. So in 2014, China was one of the first countries to start digital public money. And in that same year, there was an article published about the Fed coin, so a digital currency issued by the Fed, a quite influential article. 
uh, that were the first articles public, uh, published about this uh, digital form of public money. Uh, then in Ju July 2016, two researchers of the Bank of England, John Bardier and Michael Kumov, they coined the term central bank digital currencies. They call it central bank issued digital currencies. Uh, but it was the first bank of the Western country that published an, a, a report or a working paper on this topic. But at that time, it was really in research, the Department of Central Banks and some um, monetary geeks like myself were interested in this topic. So it was not a mainstream topic. And then in 2017, the Bank of International Settlements, they just, uh, published a discussion paper with the title Central Bank Cryptocurrencies. So they were at that time not really sure what is the right term, but they were exploring also this topic. And the Dutch Central Bank in March 2018, in their annual report, they argued arguments against issues issuing central bank digital currency outweigh the arguments in favor of doing so. And so they were not really interested in this topic at that time. But then something important happened in April 2019. Uh, so Facebook announced a proposal for the Libra, so a private currency issued by a consortium around Facebook. Uh, all on mainly American big tech companies, but also Mar MasterCards. And they said, so we can issue our own currency. And they had a big difference with Bitcoin. They had already big networks around the globe. So it was a real threat that the private, that a group of private companies would implement a digital payment system outside the banking system. So outside central banks, as well as commercial banks. And this uh, has been a really wake up, for, a wake up call for the central banking community. So since then, all major central banks are really exploring this topic of central bank digital currencies. So the ECB, China, all countries were worried that Facebook could take over the, the, the payment system in the, in the long run. And so this has really be, been a game changer. Uh, and also in 2020, so then the Dutch central bank published its first report on CBDCs. And at that time, so a bit more than two years later, they are called digital currencies, uh, digital currency issued by central banks can protect public interest in payment systems. Um, so here the threat of a, a group of private uh, companies really changed the debate around this topic. And then another important thing, so this was the crypto boom that happened um, nowadays uh, two years ago. So Curry is the head of the Innovation Center of the Bank of International Settlements. He argued in the Financial Times that central banks must act now on the crypto boom. So the threat of those cryptos is definitely also an argument for central banks to explore central bank digital currencies. Um, and in Europe, so in June this year, the European Commission presented a legislative proposal for the European central bank digital currency called the digital euro. So that will be discussed um, likely even before the elections next year um, in the European Parliament. And today, I checked it yesterday, so uh, nowadays 11 countries have a running CBDC. So they already implemented this proposal. And there's an uh, excellent CBDC tracker of the Atlantic uh, Council. So it's always up to date. So 11 countries launched a uh, central bank digital currency, mainly in the Caribbean and Nigeria. And most big countries, so 19 of the uh, G20 countries, are in a quite advanced stage of developing and pilot piloting with a central bank digital currency. So, and if you read those central bank reports and you listen to the, to the speech of central bank governors, then a lot of motivations are mentioned. And you can categorize them, I think, broadly in three groups. So the first is threat of other initiatives, so big tech initiatives of the private cryptocurrency, but nowadays also of other countries. So this is, has, of course, to do with the, yeah, the, the position of your own currency in the international environment. So therefore, a lot of central banks argue, so we must act now to not be, to, to not, uh, be behind. Uh, second, there are a lot of arguments related to payments. So it's argued that it can improve indeed the stability of the system. It can also serve as a backup system in case of a banking crash. It can reduce transaction costs, and especially in countries where the monetary financial systems are not that well developed, it can increase financial inclusion. So this is, of course, quite often an argument in uh, countries in Africa, South America. And third, so increasingly, it's, uh, central banks argue, uh, also argue that we uh, need or that we uh, should want to maintain public money. So this is more a kind of abstract argument, but that public money in itself is needed in the digital age. 
So of course we could argue, so maybe we should only have private money move into that direction, but increasingly central bankers make the argument we need a kind of reform of public money in the digital age. So we need to update the public money. So, and myself, I mainly um, follow the discussion about the digital euro. So, and when you read the ECB reports, there are uh, quite often three objectives are mentioned. So the first is preserve European strategic autonomy and payments. So nowadays, between 60 and 70 percent of the payments is operated by non-European companies, mainly uh, companies from the US. And increasingly, the political argument is that we need to bring those pay payments and their data back to Europe. A second objective is to reduce rent extraction by domestic and foreign payment service providers so that we have a public alternative that is uh, yeah, where the costs are as low as possible. A third argument this is this public money argument so that we it's important to have this monetary anchor so that we need public money when physical tra uh, cash transactions decline. So we need the kind of public money because it's important that you always can exchange private money into a form of public money. And if you look with a really critical view at those reports, then I think there is another very important but implicit objective, and that is what is currently being proposed in Europe is a digital euro that should not harm the banks and protect their business model. And in the short term, this can, of course, be an objective, but in the long term, I think this is questionable. And here you could also make the argument that in countries that have less developed banking systems, maybe they can even leapfrog Europeans and Americans uh, because there is not a really threat to the banking system. So they could, could possibly even uh, move further into the direction of a full public digital money system. And then some final thoughts also for the discussion that we will have. So, yeah, so I think that a lot of countries are likely willing to use their digital public money for interna international transactions. And of course, it's quite unlikely that they will publish it now in all kinds of reports that this is their plan for the near future. But of course, within all those countries, within all those policy institutions, there are nowadays the, the, those discussions going on. How can we use it for inter international transactions? And especially if you make those central bank digital currencies interoperable, then it has the potential to weaken the position of the dollar. For instance, if the BRICS countries agree that they use their all their central bank digital currencies to transact with each other, uh, then you have a kind of settlement system outside of the dollar, and this can really be a threat to the position of the dollar, in my view. And also, yeah, what is now being explored? So, what would happen? if we give non-residents access to our central bank digital currency. Uh, for instance, if I can also open an account in Switzerland uh, or in the US. And in a way, this can create a really new dynamic that, has, that was not possible before the digital age. So nowadays, those switching costs are really low. If you can easily open an account in another country, you can store a part of your liquidity there. Uh, it can be a good thing, but it can also create a, 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 a dynamic that is, uh, at, we don't, not yet know exactly what to expect from that dynamic. And then finally, so I think this, this conceptual view of this hierarchy of money is really important. So in a way, the, in the long term, so when we have all have access to the top of the hierarchy of money, this could really open a new channel for monetary policy. And also, when we all have their own account, so the importance of bank diminishes, and it could also be a way to reorganize or restructure the banking system. And those topics are not that often nowadays researched within central banks, but more in the academic community or in the NGO community, a lot of research are also working on this latter topic. Thank you. And thank you, Martin. That was wonderful. Thank you for the uh, uh, explanation. And also, Carmen, thanks again. Um, now we will stop the recording.